I think it's really important um, to, again, have an environment that very visually says this is a safe place and I think you have to overt that. Um, you avert it with posters, you avert it with brochures that, that this is a safe place, that it is a non-judgmental space. And I think you have to actually ask the question because for a lot of people, years ago we didn't ask about family violence. It was considered one of those taboo subjects that you just skirted around, too sensitive, just as you wouldn't ask people if they were feeling um, like hurting themselves years ago. That was a real taboo issue. and because we thought that might be putting the idea into their head or it might be offensive to ask about family violence. But now it's sort of standard practice to ask about family violence because we understand that once you've asked the question, you've given permission for that to be talked about and you've, you've basically said, we can hold this. We're strong enough to hold what you have to tell um, as a service. And I believe that the same is true of sexual assault. I, th I think I... I think it's a really good best practice to say to people, we would like to ask you, not perhaps in the first meeting with them, maybe the second or third when there's been some rapport built up, but, but it's a really good practice to say, we'd like to feel free to ask you a number of questions. There are some sensitive issues there, but we would like to feel free to ask them and we'd like you to feel free to say that you would like to or not answer those questions as, as feels right for you. But I've seen many occasions where, especially with younger men, where their shoulders kind of drop and the big sigh comes out when you've asked. Has, so has someone hurt you sexually? Has someone um, hurt you in a way that you haven't been able to talk to other people about? And it's a huge relief to be asked because it is permission giving. Um, so that's, that's definitely something I think non-sexual assault services can do. It's uncomfortable to begin with. It's a bit like asking people questions around whether or not they've used violence in the past as a way of dealing with their issues, as a way of coping. But it's a question we have to ask. Um, if we don't know what the issues are that are going on for the person and we don't we don't present a forum that says it's safe to talk about that, we don't get to the heart of, of the blockages that are stopping them from moving on in their life. So not always, obviously not always, but but Quite often abuse occurs in the context of a relationship that is a close relationship and where there is some trust and where there is a sense of um, intimacy. So I think that there's a paradox here in that sometimes disclosure also occurs in those sort of relationships, yet there are also relationships that have all those preconditions that the person has learnt make it unsafe. So I think for, for any worker, there's, there's this tension that sits that you know, we offer our clients a space where they can learn over time that we're not going to betray what they tell us, that we're going to be careful about confidentiality, that we're going to be as transparent as possible, that within the constraints and the boundaries of our role, we become as human as we can. And that creates conditions where people start to trust us. But for some of the men that we work with, that also replicates the circumstances in which the abuse occurred. So I think it's not enough to say, well, we just set up the relationship because the relationship is not enough. Um, I think sometimes, um, and, I, and I'm not actually completely sure how you calibrate this, and sometimes I think it's just a, a gut feeling of this is the right time to do this. But in a relationship with someone, whether you're a worker specifically working in the area of sexual assault or, or a generic community worker working in another area, asking the question can sometimes be useful. And I think asking a person, you know, obviously within some context, you know, then. You've, you've told me a number of things that have made me wonder whether there's been some bad stuff that happened to you when you were younger and I'm even wondering whether you know, it, it, it may be what we, you know, in some form of abuse. I probably wouldn't even say sexual abuse at that stage, I'd say some sort of abuse because it still keeps it a little bit broader. But getting a bit more specific and focused with the questions allows, because sometimes people <laughs> won't tell you unless they're asked. Um, and I think if they don't want to tell you, then they won't tell you. In a sense, you haven't lost much by asking the question, but you're, you're giving the message that I'm, I'm actually okay to hear it. People need to understand or be prepared to find out gently what has led the person 
to want to disclose. I guess there's two things. Sometimes people will have disclosed because of a crisis. So they will come to, come to the person um, with a crisis uh, and in amongst it they will have disclosed because perhaps the partner, the wife has said, I can do this no more. Or they've had one too many arrests for drug and alcohol or they've hit the, hit the skids the la one, more, one too many times, a, a life of ruin of the last 25 years. And so a number of people will disclose um, in a state of crisis or disarray um, or desperation. Um, we often see men who have been forced to spontaneously disclose unexpectedly to themselves when their wife has said, this is it, I'm going. And all of a sudden they'll say, oh, I can't talk to you because, is there a last chance? So people have often disclosed unexpectedly and are left with exposed thoughts, feeling overwhelmed, but with a partner who all of a sudden thinks the light bulb's gone on, or they come in because they're at desperation point and they can't go on like this anymore. So they may have disclosed to you, and it's about helping them understand and pick up the pieces at that point and find the right response, which would be um, re helping them feel safe and, and it's the, the same result is that they need it to be in a place where they can feel trusted, um, where they feel that they will trust someone else, where they feel safe. So then this, the response would be the same as if a person is preparing to disclose and planning that with someone. So the issue is about having a, a conversation with people where they can start to feel safe, help them have some strategies that will help manage their thoughts and their mind, or if you don't know how to do that, find someone who will. So bear in mind, you, you never know whether this is the first time that a man may have talked about this stuff. Uh, they may say so, they may not. Um, the result of a first disclosure is, is really crucial. So if a man feels judged, harassed, shamed, it will be much harder for him to speak about it again. So the way to ensure that that he doesn't feel that way, I would say have an attitude of, of openness, have an attitude of belief, try, as I think I mentioned before, to keep the emotionality you know, to a reasonable um, level so that man doesn't feel that he's upsetting or distressing you or there's something completely you know, out, of, out of this world about his experience. Um, don't ask questions around how could you, you know, have the sense of how could you have got yourself into this situation, why did you do this, nothing that sounds like it might be at all judgy, because there's enough judgement in the way we do masculinity in this culture about men who have survived this kind of thing, for guys to have already taken that on board, so we have to avoid any kind of hint of that when talking about disclosure. And I, I think I mentioned this earlier too, ask the question. One of the big changes that I've seen in my time, when I first started, it was not that common that men would talk about this sort of thing, and that was one of the reasons why we set up as a men-only service. Now it's much more common, it's much more in the media, you know, the work of the Royal Commission just recently has made a big difference in this. What that's me meant is that I think it's easier for men to speak. Um, it's my experience that men are able to speak more openly about this now. So the more it's part of the normal discourse, when you're working with someone in any service where you're working with traumatised people, to ask a man about his his background in terms of um, assault, you know, sexual assault specifically, just normalises the fact that this stuff happens. There's a lot of it about, and that I think makes it easier for survivors to speak. Also, for for boys that uh, and men who've been sexually abused by women, there's a, a story that doesn't even name that as being sexual abuse. So it's very difficult to to name that as an an abusive experience. Um, so I think. You know, and I suppose that just gives it all those factors and, and a whole bunch of other things create a context where it's more difficult to disclose or talk about sexual abuse than it is not to. And it's in, in, from a perspective of caring for oneself, it, it will often make more sense not to tell anybody because you're, you're wanting to protect yourself from those judgments or from those unhelpful statements and ideas and I think it's only through the development of a, of a climate of, of trust and respect and acknowledgement that, that people might allow the possibility that you as a worker or you as a person might not hold some of those unhelpful ideas. 
To assist men feel like it's okay to disclose, we need to implicitly and explicitly give permission that um, it's not about disclosing a per, a, an experience of sexual abuse, it's not about weakness, it's not about not being good enough, it's not about not being a man, it's not about defining things in a way or colluding with a definition of masculinity that a male has to be strong all the time. I think it's about presenting an openness um, in a this is overly, overly used, this word, next word is overly used, but in a non-judgmental way, but in an openness of acceptance that whatever you tell me is going to be okay. It's absolutely going to be okay. Um, with the provisos that if the person who, if the person, man discloses to me the perpetrator's name, that he already knows that if that person is continuing to perpetrate, is in a position of continuing to perpetrate, then I will need to professionally um, uh, report that person because someone's still in 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 in, uh, in, uh, in danger. But I would do that with the person. I'm not going to go off and do that on my own. Well, you know, the, you know, the, let's keep it simple. Is like believing them. You know, really believing the person's experience and not not asking questions that convey um, doubt. Like I, I remember a client said to me that their therapist um, asked them a, a, a why question, you know, why did that happen to you? And immediately what they heard was there's something wrong with me that, that, that this happened to me. So I think questions can, we have to be very careful with our questions because it can sound like you've got to justify. Um, so being validating and believing um, someone's disclosure is very important and conveying um, respect and interest and empathy um, and appreciation of their courage to take the risk to disclose and to you know kind of take a stand against all the things that get in the way of disclosing like shame and fear and dominant masculinity and I think those things are important at, you know on a really basic level um, so being validating and creating a safe environment in, in general is important too, yeah. I suppose this is probably more a question that I think the workers are probably uh, beginning to look at and it's you know, more of a possibility now than it had been a few years ago. Um, and uh, uh, there's, you know, particularly those workers, say, in drug and alcohol or those other areas, uh, for them to understand that, the, you know, they can provide a really quality response to people. Uh, that um, being somebody who um, a man might feel uh, is they have a, an okay relationship, who they can trust, uh, they can, uh, who will listen to them, it's really important. Um, I think for people to understand that every disclosure is an opportunity for uh, somebody to feel supported and heard. There's not, you know, just a single moment of disclosure and, and you know, that as a child it's not always the first disclosure that's necessarily, uh, the, you know, the really important one. Uh, it might be that every time a man kind of broaches the subject or uh, answers to somebody's question about whether they've been abused is an opportunity to provide extra support and assistance. I think it's really important also for those uh, workers to understand it's not just about somebody feeling validated and heard and believed and that's that's a very important thing to do but it's also checking them in with them about what support they might need um, now uh, with that something they've spoken with somebody about um, would they feel they would like to speak with uh, somebody more about this? Um, and, and really uh, not then, you know, closing it down, never to be spoken again. It might be useful to check in later on about whether this was, uh, whether they do want some more information now or how they're traveling in relation to this. Um, check in whether somebody's, uh, having difficult thoughts, emotions related to the sexual abuse, uh, not presuming that all problems are related to the sexual abuse and you know that this is the kind of uh, 
you know, the, the key to all their life's problems. Uh, so really checking in with them about how they've managed that, uh, and whether they want any more support or not. Um, it's also getting themselves informed about what resources are available, what, uh, what in their area, what linkages, who might do the work with men in their area. Um, and, and so that they can be provide a warm referral. Um, I think also one of the challenges for workers is if they do have a standard question about whether somebody's been sexually abused or sexually assaulted, is to not think if somebody answered in the negative that they weren't, or not to think if somebody answered in the positive and you check whether they're okay and they say, yeah, 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 I'm all right, to just leave it there uh, permanently. Uh, it might be useful to check back in a bit later on uh, about that uh, and uh, to acknowledge the, uh, the trust and the challenges that can face guys uh, in, in answering that and I think that's really important uh, to, to talk through and say you know maybe you've spoken with somebody or you're aware that some of the barriers to disclosure and then you can discuss some of those bit around the ideas of masculinity uh, uh, sexuality, offending, a uh, sense of um, shame, guilt that some people can carry, uh, that can then open up another conversation for people. I think one of the first things to hold in mind is that um, this is an opportunity and it may be the only opportunity that this man is, um, is offering you and, and him to talk about this stuff. And I think it's important to, uh, to honour that and honour the trust that's being shown to you um, without questioning why. It's not your choice. It's, I think, your client's choice to, um, to, to bring up this issue. And there's obviously a reason for that. So one doesn't have to unpack that, I, I don't think, necessarily. But just to accept that they have chosen you at this point in time to, um, to bring up this issue. So responding appropriately by not having to rescue, not feeling as though you have to fix, not feeling as though you have to have um, solutions. But really that idea of bearing witness I think is really important. But simply asking what is it you would like me to do uh, that would be helpful in this situation. I think that's keeping it really simple initially and not overwhelming with our help. Uh, sometimes I think we can rush in too soon with ideas. We need to listen more, talk less. What's really important is, is um, uh, the role of listening. And it's, you know, to, to take the time and uh, not just go through, you know, the routine of looking like you're listening, but to really attend to the person that you're with, that they know that, that, that you're hearing what, what they're saying. So I think listening, listening, making the time to listen. So ensuring within the, the meeting with, with the person or the session, whatever, that you, you, you make sure you have enough time to, to spend listening and not coming up with ideas that could make things better for the person. Um, and uh, of course there's the issue of belief that um, most people um, don't lie about sexual assault so it's very important to believe what the person is saying and, and you know it may be that someone who's been involved in another system uh, could have had an experience of not being believed so this could be quite pivotal um, this could be the first time the person has been believed and, and, and that could ensure that, okay, this time they, they will access, access support. So I think that's so important. I'll come back to um, uh, respect power. If you're working with anyone in you know, a non-sexual assault context, um, sexual assault survivors have been overpowered, whether it was as an adult or a child, they've been hugely subject to um, all kinds of power manipulations and uh, some of the detail of that uh, would come up when we talk about what perps actually do to make kids more vulnerable and more isolated. Um, now they may not consciously think in power categories of thinking but their experience has made them justifiably very wary of anyone who uses power. 
Once again, can I say also, the important ingredient there is helping the person feel that they have a sense of personal control. So if, if the worker can do nothing else but to allow them to say, acknowledge something has happened to you, but what we're going to do is help you stay in control of this. Uh, allow them to have as many choices. They may give a hint about disclosure. They may say, I want help to disclose, to talk more about this and deal with it. But allow them choice of timing and choice of who they go and see and when and the assurance that they are going to be in charge of the process. I think one of the difficulties with uh, drug and alcohol uh, workers is, um, is sometimes a framework for practice might come from a, a position of, um, uh, of, of damage and I think that comes across to the fellows. Uh, they, they, they have that message already on board so it doesn't take much to confirm that, that they are damaged souls and, uh, and they're repeated. Um, uh, periods in rehab just confirms that further for them. So that idea of uh, again, you know, being hopeful and um, not seeing their rehab as um, you know just one more attempt that it could be the one, and re retaining that that hope I think is important. One of the issues I find with the drug and alcohol counsellors, uh, sometimes particularly in residential rehab, is, is they do tend to give the message to the fellows that they need to talk about their ex experiences of child sexual abuse. Once it's been flagged as something that's there, the fellows don't necessarily want to talk about it at that point in time, but they're just letting the counsellor know that it is an issue for them. Sometimes the counsellors, I think, in their earnestness to help, do tell them you need to talk about this. It's, it's good for you, sort of thing. Um, I think the fellows often are very fearful about losing control of that information. They might want to flag that it's there, but they don't want to talk about the detail of it necessarily. And they want to be in control of who they talk about it to and when and how much and what they, what they uh, choose to leave out is important but they do have a sense that there's healing in the telling of it and they get this impression that unless they actually tell the story, the full story, that their um, abstinence, their rehab is going to be compromised. So it's that kind of gateway idea that unless you um, reveal all in what, step four or five or whatever it is in the, in, the, in the programs, unless you do that, you're not going to have the key to the gate of, um, you know, continuing abstinence. So it's very worrying for the fellows then, that idea of, um, you know, control and, uh, and not having um, that uh, clear passage through to forgiveness or abstinence or whatever is on the other side unless they are prepared to tell that whole story. So I think it's a very unfair condition that is applied and uh, it's very worrying for the fellows. <laughs>